Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I've worked uh, as a hydrographer and ocean mapper for since 2005 now, and I'm here this afternoon to speak to you regarding a new undertaking that uh, my agency, NOAA, is looking to get underway in the next one to two years, um, which is to incorporate mapping operations while transiting from our project to project locations. Um, so over the next few slides, we'll look at a few of the, the different GIS models we're using to smartly design and um, lay out transit mapping for our NOAA fleet. Uh, as I said before, we're using, we're looking to use GIS as a route planning tool, and there's already a number of pretty robust GIS models um, that we have made over the last two to three years, and some of them are still in design phase now, but we'll be using those to uh, lay out uh, where our vessels transit from place to place, uh, to better util uh, utilizing standards and um, collecting bathymetric data, predominantly from our multi beam systems on our ocean mapping ships. Uh, the data will be... Um, Supplemental bathymetric data to fill in gaps for areas we aren't, aren't necessarily our critical priority areas, but haven't either been surveyed or mapped in a very long time, or maybe in some instances still white space on our nautical charts. And um, the data can also be utilized, will also be utilized for uh, habitat mapping, um, further analysis for critical mineral studies, which is kind of a new area of study under within NOAA and to support nautical products and services with um, the Knoxville Coast Survey and a number of other agency priorities. Um, uh, just a brief overview of our fleet. There's 16 active NOAA vessels. Um, I should say oceanographic vessels. We also have a, a whole fleet of small boats, um, but this is just primarily focused on the large vessels, eight of which are outfitted with multi-beam systems. Um, the other eight are from our National Marine Fisheries Service, they also have multi-beam systems, but those are water column systems, the ME-70s, and we haven't quite figured a rudimentary way of acquiring um, bottom detection while underway with those. So for the time being, we aren't, we aren't looking to use those for um, mapping data while underway in transits. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the other eight ships with the multi-beam systems, we are looking to use those uh, to acquire shallow water, mid-water, and deep water multi-beam uh, bathymetric data. Uh, there's if you add up the, um, well, for, for first of all, the, the graphic over on the right is just a, a screenshot of the NOAA fleet allocation plan, which is a schedule of where our boats work um, for the next calendar year, fiscal year. So the green, purple, or green, pink, blue, red, and orange uh, little squares are just individual projects. The tiny white space in between those are imports, so there'd be a transit to import and a transit from it back out. Um, the big long gray boxes are times of inactivity when they're alongside for repair, maintenance, and uh, crew training. So those times aren't, aren't included in this, but if you add up the eight ships and their scheduled projects, you get a roughly 120 transits. So it's a very large amount of time going unutilized for mapping, which will produce a whole new data stream that will be publicly provided and served up on um, the National Center for Environmental Information website under the Bathymetric um, Bathy Data Viewer, uh, and will be a whole nother, whole nother avenue of data uh, acquisition that we aren't currently using right now. Uh, within the slides, I thought I had embedded a, a, oh yeah, a, a link to the NOAA fleet if anyone's interested in um, reading more about what the NOAA fleet has to offer. Uh, a, new, a new model that um, the Office of the Coast Survey has been working on for the last two years and will be publicly released in 2019 in a GIS interface is a hydrographic health model. Um, this is a risk-based GIS model built from Esri software. Uh, it, it takes into a number of different layers and spits out five or six um, different models. I've included two on here, um, two of the more primary ones. The, greenish, the green heat map on the bottom is the hydro risk model, um, which, looks, which takes into consideration Changeability, weather, uh, currents, the age of the charted data, uh, vessel traffic. There's four other main models, and those all get ran through an algorithm, and then it spits out the hydro health model, which is on top. Um, this is a, a view of all of our U.S. waters, so it kind of just looks like orange and yellow, but when you zoom in to the ports and the shallower water areas, you can see you know, a more robust heat map. 
And the redder areas are the higher priority areas, like you can see some of them outlined in the Gulf of Mexico um, and up along the eastern seaboard. Um, but this is what NOAA will assess and define hydro survey plans going forward. And we, like I said, we've been working on it for two or three years, so we're really excited to get it out um, to the public interface. And we'll use this going forward when we plan our hydrographic surveys, uh, of which there's around 40 or so a year, um, based off of our NOAA fleet. And we also have eight hydro contract vendors who also support our mission. Um, so that'll be earlier to use to help us better design our route planning for areas of um, higher mission focus, but that aren't necessarily assigned a hydrographic survey for any given year. This next slide is uh, on bathymetric gap analysis, which was put together by a team from uh, the National Ocean Service, then the Office of Coast Survey, and along with uh, University of New Hampshire's Center for Coastal and Ocean Management and the Joint Hydrographic Center uh, to design this gap analysis um, which was largely put together to support uh, the Seabed 2030 initiative, which I'll, I'll skip forward one slide and then we'll come back to this just for a very quick overview <clears throat> of what Seabed 2030 is. It's a <clears throat> global initiative led by the General Bathymetric Chart of the Oceans, known as GIPCO, uh, in conjunction with the Nipton Foundation with an overall focus to facilitate the complete mapping of the world's oceans by 2030. Uh, NOAA is only focused on federal waters, so my office will be focusing on <coughs> surveying, surveying and filling in the gaps within our U.S. federal waters. Um, the graphic over here on the right is just a screen grab of the model for the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic. However, it is, we, we generated it for, the, for all U.S., so there's <coughs> the Pacific Coast, Alaska, Hawaii, and, uh, and the South Pacific Islands as well. Um, what, what you see on here is a big purple blob and some speckly blue. Those are just areas of coverage for um, bathymetric data for multi-beam and single beam, and then the shoal or coastal waters, um, it also includes LIDAR. Um, the purple is a higher density sounding set, and the blue um, is a lower density sounding set. And it's a little misleading from this scale, but if you zoom into it, it looks like there's a whole, a whole lot of gap or unfilled areas, but in reality what it is, along, especially along the East Coast, is it single beam data from um, legacy side scan and single beam surveys that didn't completely fill the whole cell with a, a grid node, so it comes in as a track line instead of a solid um, filled cell, like the offshore part. <clears throat> this layer will be used uh, as an overlay in conjunction with the hydro health model to find uh, air, uh, gaps in our coverage, our bathymetric, bathymetric coverage, and um, gaps in some of our nautical charts where the data is very outdated, and we could utilize these long transits uh, to and from various places <coughs> in the East Coast, in the Gulf of Mexico, and along the Pacific and Alaska to fill in some of these gaps. This is also archived at NOAA's NZEI, and I put a um, link to their website on the slide. And it's also publicly available. You can download it. It's um, on Esri online. It's an Esri product, so you can access it. Uh, this, um, over the last five or six years, the National Ocean Service has been working to do regional prioritizations. Um, there are five right now complete for the following locations, for Long Island Sound, uh, the Caribbean, the Pacific coast of Washington State, Southern California Bight, Lake Michigan. We're doing Florida now, and we're doing the um, Gulf of Mexico states in the next two years. And this is largely, a, um, largely a, a user interface with the user community from these different regions. So you start out having workshops and planning meetings with various state, federal, academic, and local um, groups of interest. A lot of, a lot of the counties from, for this particular example, we're looking at the Pacific Coast we did in Washington. Um, so there's a lot of tribal interest from it, um, the counties from the state, different federal agencies, and University of Washington. And um, a number of meetings we had together to kind of determine the gaps in coverage and priority areas. And the, um, there's this Esri tool, uh, prioritization tool, which you define, your user defined priority area, 
which is a slide on the furthest to the left. Um, for this particular prioritization, they decided to go, I think it's the 1,000 fathom contour, or 800 fathom contour, um, and, and then coastal. And it encompasses the uh, Olympic Coast Now Spring Sanctuary. And so we had, I think, 21 um, different industries fill out the prioritization, which is an online ESRI tool. And you come to the prioritization output, which is the second slide over from the left, the bluish one, which it would just be a single entry from one of the groups filling it out. Um, there would have been 20 other ones. And then it runs through an algorithm, and it spits out the combined heat map, which outlines the prioritization, the, most, the highest priority areas for this region based on the inputs. And then from that, the, the hope is, the idea is to do collaborative mapping or mapping um, projects and fill in these um, areas of priority. So 2016, 17, and 18, the NOAA ship Rainier surveyed the areas that are highlighted in um, the different shades of purple. We also filled in using existing data from the Ambari and the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer from 2008. So we were able to fill in the offshore priority areas, and now we're looking to fill in the, um, <clears throat> the coastal areas, which is a lot more challenging on, for this area because of the sea state um, and the rocky seafloor. It's very hard to do any kind of mapping along the coast. So, But uh, we're working on that now with Florida and the states and the Gulf Coast. This is also this is another slide for another uh, resource planning resource we'll be using for track, uh, transit route mapping. Uh, Crowdsource bathymetry, which is a new also a new kind of endeavor within NOAA to pull in um, bathymetric data acquired from vessels using standard navigation equipment, not necessarily ocean mapping or hydrographic surveying equipment, but like their fatometer and their GPS unit, um, and utilize that data. Uh, for areas that potentially hold a, you know, a, a number of uses. And so this is just a screenshot. There's a bathymetric, there's a, sorry, a crowdsourced bathymetric database that is housed on the um, IHO data center for crowdsourced bathymetry. And I put a link down there if anyone's interested in checking it out. But we've been, we've been pulling data from this now and looking at application, uh, application of it in our charting products. Uh, so the big idea behind all this is to use these different layers. That certainly wasn't an exhaustive list. There was just some examples. Um, to more thoroughly plan out our vessel transits. Um, and we certainly won't be sacrificing safety. I mean, safety will surmount any, you know, any mapping endeavor. It's just, uh, <clears throat> this will just be another, another data source. And once we get it up and running, like I said before, there's 120 transits. So there's potentially another 120 surveys coming in each year, or you know, a very large amount of data coming in. Uh, there's another another topic I didn't really get into today, but there's the environmental compliance portion, which all federal agencies have to adhere to a pretty stringent set of environmental compliance um, policies and procedures, which is a whole other set of GIS layers that we'll be loading um, and compiling for this undertaking, since we'll be having to basically run this uh, environmental compliance for all of our U.S. waters. Um, <clears throat> the, in the increased data acquisition is just a great opportunity to better support our agency-wide missions and requirements, and it's a better use of federally funded vessels and ship time uh, that currently go, for a large part, unutilized for sometimes up to several days on just deadheads when they're going <clears throat> like out to Hawaii or up to Alaska. So that's, uh, that's all I had for today. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer.